You're currently looking at video from the DV Power D5, an action cam that costs around $35 and is actually good. And by actually good, I mean it's hard to recommend any other camera under $80 now, just because the vast majority of other cams have inferior video and audio quality. And it's kind of true. In the $50 to $80 price point, few cameras can match the D5 in terms of video quality. But glowing introductions aside, out of the get-go, it's important to note that this is a cheap camera, and so it has a few small quirks. Video quality is quite good, but I wouldn't say excellent, and there are a few little issues with the user interface. Spending more money on something premium will net you a better camera. Now that that's out of the way, let's talk about the D5. It comes packed with a small kit of accessories and mounts. I appreciate how they're not in little plastic baggies, and I wish more action cam makers would do this. It's a little bit better for the environment. Notably, this kit also includes two batteries and a remote. Build quality-wise, the D5 feels way nicer than it should for the price. It's pretty solid, none of that hollow feeling that many other budget action cams have. The battery door slides smoothly, and the buttons are nice to press. As with most cheap cameras, it's not waterproof unless you're using the external case. It definitely feels more like a $100 camera and also looks strikingly similar to the Acaso V50 Pro, just with a bit of a glossy finish. I wouldn't be surprised if they're actually based on the same internal sensor and processor, and the V50 Pro costs closer to $120. They even use the same antiquated mini USB cable for charging, which is kind of horrible. So yes, the D5 appears to be a rebrand of the Acaso V50 Pro, which appears to be a rebrand of the MG Cool Explorer 3. Make what you want of that. On top of the cam are two control buttons which are psychologically backwards to me. The outer one does power and mode switching, and the inner one does the start and stop recording. Basic UI interactions can be navigated with these two buttons, but more advanced settings must be changed using touch. There are actually a surprising amount of settings, including important ones like mic volume, however, some things are missing. For example, this camera only has three resolutions, 4K 30, 1080p 60, and 720p 120. This is also where we run into a big quirk. The camera's user interface is rather confusing to navigate. It starts out fine with these little pop-out menus on the sides and the bottom of the camera, which do mode switching, turning Wi-Fi on and off, that sort of stuff. But in order to access settings, you pop out the menu on the right hand side, tap on settings, and then you're presented with a sub-menu that looks so similar to the top menu that it's difficult to know what you're actually doing. There's also no smooth scrolling in lists, so you can only go one page at a time by flicking. When you want to back out of the menu, just tap the arrow on the top, and then back out by pressing on the side, it's not immediately obvious. I guess you can get used to this user interface, but it's definitely not super intuitive out of the gate. There are a few bugs as well. For example, playing back video causes the camera to freeze. Yep, something as simple as playing back video, but uh, you can unfreeze it by pulling the battery. Kind of a pain in the butt to deal with. Also, for some reason I seem unable to format the card with the camera, and I'm not sure if this has to do with my particular memory card in this camera, but it says the formatting was successful, but when I checked on my computer, all the old files were still there. Thankfully, the camera is not picky about memory cards and takes ones formatted by my computer. And that's about it. Those are the two main major usability issues with this camera. When reviewing cheap cameras, I always ask to myself, what is the catch? Normally on budget cameras, there are some serious issues like the 4K video is not actually 4K, or audio quality is poor, or something like that which makes it hard to recommend the camera. But with the D5, well, video quality wise, it's real 4K. It has basic image stabilization, audio sounds good enough, pictures have a decent amount of detail. Now, none of these things are going to be professional, mind you. The 4K video doesn't have as much detail as something like the Acaso V50X, nor is the stabilization as good as that camera. In fact, I'd say that camera is the next major step up from this one. The audio is not as clear as the Vantop Moment 6S, but that one is two steps up price-wise. Here's the thing, I'm not really sure any of those things matter all that much. 
For the vast majority of consumers, saving $60 or more will outweigh any of these small issues, which for the most part won't even be noticed unless the camera is side by side with another cam. The 4K is good enough. The image stabilization, not great, but good enough. The audio quality, good enough. And this is an observation comparing the D5 to cameras that cost $100 or $150. When comparing it to $50 cameras, let alone $40 or $30 or other $20 cameras, it blows all those away. The D5 is the kind of camera I could see many average users buying and being happy with, even though it doesn't have top performance in any one area. Everything it does is good enough, like I said before, and at times it can even be great. If I were, say, preteen age and only had pocket money from mowing neighbors' lawns, then I would love to buy this and make fun of all my friends who spent hundreds on GoPros. That's a huge potential savings for someone younger when they're just looking for a functional camera and money is of higher value. I could also see it being a camera I buy for my sister's six-year-old who wants to be like his parents and use a GoPro, but we can't exactly justify spending money on it because he will probably break it. And to be fair, this camera is good enough that I could even see buying one for my other family members or just keeping it for myself as a spare for situations I don't want to put a more expensive camera in. I wanted to see what it would be like to use only this camera as my main for a trip and so that's what I did. I took it up to the Clyde Dam in central Otago, New Zealand and took some footage there, played around with the settings a bit, took a few time lapses, and even used the app to download videos to my phone. And then I promptly left the camera on in my pocket and killed the battery. Whoops. The entire spillway at the Clyde Dam is open just because there is so much rainwater that's been coming through the last couple weeks. Let's check this out. Take a look over here. I do have the wind noise filter turned on right now, but uh, as you can see, it's very windy out there. Let's see how this goes. I, I don't think it's going to be very good. There's probably a maximum limit that the wind noise filter can actually be. Most of the footage I got was pretty good and once I got used to the quirky menus it was easy enough to change settings. With some color grading the footage I got could even be great. But speaking of battery life, I think that's the biggest issue with the camera for me. I would expect to get an hour or less of filming at 4K, probably closer to 45 minutes. Two batteries are included in the box, but there is no charger included, meaning that batteries need to be charged inside of the camera. I've linked a spare set of batteries that are compatible with this, funny enough, the Acaso V50 Pro batteries, as well as a charger in the description. But the charger costs nearly as much as the camera itself when the camera's on sale. You're almost better off to buy two of these cams and just use one for charging, which would be a total waste environmentally, but it's kind of crazy that that financially even makes sense. So how does the D5 compare to other cameras? Well, if you're looking at this camera versus most cams in the $20 to $50 range, there's really nothing else. This camera is real 4K, and most of those cameras are faking it somehow whether they're dropping frames, using a lower resolution and upping it. My previous budget recommendation, the Suku C30, was not real 4K, but it was pretty good overall. But the D5 tops it in almost every way. It's got better video quality, better audio quality, probably about the same for stabilization, better build quality. 
so there's really no more reason to recommend that camera. Once you start getting into the $80 to $100 range, there are several cameras that are pretty good, like the Xiaomi Seabird action camera, the 8 Men Trao action camera, or the previously mentioned V50X. Reasons to upgrade to that camera in particular would be better EIS, sharper video, and nicer color rendering. Going further into the $200 price range, you've got the SJ8 Pro or the Vantop Moment 6S, both which have true 4K 60 frames per second. While all these things are priorities for some people, I personally find myself doing stabilization in post-production anyways, and 4K 60 is something that I rarely use. The stabilization on the D5 does work well enough, even though it is a little bit more basic. It rocks side to side a little bit instead of holding center, and in these shots when I'm riding with the camera mounted to my handlebars, it does correct most bumps. Although, it looks like there is a little bit of lens distortion error, especially around the center and the edges of the frame. You can see it wobbling and shaking just a little bit, but I don't think you'd really notice that unless I pointed it out. This is all pretty average stuff for low-end budget cameras. As for audio quality, it's mostly loud and pretty clear, although it does have a little bit of a weird echo to it. Talking too close to the camera will cause peaking and fuzziness, but surprisingly this camera does have a mic volume setting. As with most action cameras, audio while inside the waterproof case is not that good, and the camera does pick up wind noise, but again, surprisingly it has a wind noise filter setting. That works marginally well. Another area where the D5 is decidedly average is low light. With image stabilization turned on, this camera locks itself to 1 30th of a second shutter speed. What that means is the camera is trying to prevent blur from the EIS, but it makes things too dark. And there we go. So really the only way to film at night is with image stabilization turned off, and even then it's not super bright. See? how well you can see this, these flowers and stuff. Turn off the EIS and everything gets a little bit brighter, but really only a little bit brighter. If it were a particularly bright night out and you were under street lights or some bright lights, I think you'd get workable footage, but even in this night where it's a full moon and under the LED street lights, I really can't see that much. Once you get under the orange street lights, it's a little bit better, but even inside my garage, which is pretty well lit for a garage, detail is smudgy and shadows are too dark. Like I said, for the most part, you're going to be able to tell what is going on, just that if it is too dark, you won't see much. Basically, this camera likes a lot of light. The brighter, the better. Still photos are also pretty decent. There is an acceptable level of detail during the day and colors are fairly accurate. There is a metric ton of distortion thanks to the ultra wide lens. In low light, still photos it takes are not super blurry despite my shaky hands. You can definitely get a camera with more detail, noticing a trend here, but you will have to spend a lot more money to manage that. And with that, I mean it sort of brings me to the crux of this camera. Why is it so cheap? It's Average overall, decent video quality, decent audio quality, decent photos, nothing that stands out in particular, but at its current price point of $35, it stands out in all of those categories as being better than the competition. Well, I think when the camera was released, it appeared to have a price point of around $70, which is still a pretty decent price for what you get, but things are a little bit fuzzier at that point. Just because I mentioned earlier there's the 8 Men Trao or the Seabird Action Cam which are both pretty good. I have a feeling that this is old stock on Amazon, and Amazon starts to charge storage fees for stock that has sat around for a long time, so that incentivizes sellers to move product. Likely these sellers are losing money on this item so they're trying to get rid of them. My recommendation if you're looking for an Action Cam, the cheapest of the cheap, this is a very good bet especially when it goes on sale for $20. Yes, that's right, $20. Sure, it's not perfect and 
To be fair, it's overall average in almost every area, but if you don't have a premium action cam on hand to compare it to, more than likely you'll be happy with the performance. And you'll also be happy with the money you saved, which you can spend on accessories, a trip, or... Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna stop before this video goes over 15 minutes. I hope this video was helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If not, uh, please do the same thing. I mean, video engagements. Yay. YouTube metrics. Here, have some pretty shots to end the video off.